Hello, John. Thank you so much for coming back to speak with us. The last video that we did got so many views. People loved it. Tons of questions. And I want to just do a quick uh, kind of overview of who you are, what we're here for today. And of course, I'm going to let you speak to that. But just in case folks don't know who John is, for over 20 years, he's been a respected researcher in the UFO community and in cryptozoology. He was the principal investigator on the jaw-dropping investigation, uh, 1997 film, Area 51, the alien interview that was smuggled out of an underground government facility in uh, Nevada. When was that in 51, John? Oh, it was uh, smuggled out in ni in uh, 90, 91. Oh, in 91. Okay, right. Yeah, middle of so, 91. John, if you could just give us a quick summary of who you are, what we're here for today, for folks that don't know you, yeah, take it away. Sure. Yeah, 56 years old, born and raised in the Chicago area, um, a far northwest side of Chicago. Uh, grew up in the Chicago in the 70s, which I, I think is really important to tell people who... <laughs> didn't live in Chicago or got Chicago TV. My friends and I, who I, I still am friends with my grade school and high school friends, we all laugh that, you know, we're, we're part batshit crazy uh, from watching Chicago TV from the, you know, the, the, the brawling wrestling that was on Sunday mornings to a Jewish guy in front of an acorn singing Jewish songs. And we never understood why the language was weird until we were like in college. We're like, Oh, it was for Jewish kids, you know, uh, for captain kangaroo. And we had another person on the bozo, the clown network called Frazier Thomas. He also like captain kangaroo had this military jacket with the epaulots talking to a, 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 a goose, a goose puppet. We <laughs> had a program called giggle snorter hotel where a guy molded clay and would talk to it and puppets and, my point is without going on and on is that uh, that experience not only made me half crazy, but really expanded my mind. Like, Hey, look, life is, you know, an open book. Uh, don't be so closed minded. So, um, and, you know, I was uh, a high school college and semi-pro football player, a uh, standout in high school. I, I uh, went to Memphis state, now the university of Memphis. But when I was down in Memphis a state, I actually got into professional wrestling and I did that on and off for 20 years. My uh, the peak of my career, I wrestled for the light heavyweight championship of the world on ESPN while still a junior in high school um, in uh, 1990. Uh, so although that journey, I didn't make a lot of money at it. It was my lifelong dream. And uh, I ran for Congress, Illinois governor. I was on the ballot in November as a replacement candidate for Illinois Secretary of State. And married to this wonderful a woman named Joanne for 24 years. We have three beautiful children. And since the start of COVID, I, like a dingling, decided to investigate fully journalistic, you know, a credibility, this bizarre uh, film a documentary from 1997 called the Area 51 Alien Interview, a film allegedly smuggled out of a facility south of Area 51 by a government whistleblower named Victor. And to investigate it, very important to simply find the truth, whatever it is. And it's five years later, I still have no stake in the game, meaning it doesn't matter to me. And theatrically, a Hollywood talk, it's a, it's a better story if it's proven a hoax and it's a fake. You know, it's the, it's the surprise ending. Um, the problem is, is five years later, not one person from Hollywood, not one person from the military, not one person from ufology, not one person from special effects um, corridors has conclusively with credibility proven and shown why this film is a hoax. It's actually been the flip side where we've actually, and I said this on your program, you know, found the provenance who allegedly was in the viewing room watching this being the entire program project called Project Aquarius. I think that is, I think that's the documentary. Forget the film. It's what I found in researching this film, the other rabbit hole, which is, you know, the Majestic program and then Project Aquarius, which was the uh, acquisition 
the retention, the housing, and interrogation of off-planet biological beings. So I sit here today waiting for Hollywood to uh, to put this on as a documentary. And we and just to let people know, because I've had people ask me, especially from, from your program, well, it's, what do you want to give it to Hollywood for? Because the media won't pay attention to me. I, I mean, if this was on the New York Times, folks, I'd be, you know, I'd be semi-retired and minding my own business. The media won't touch this. Mm -hmm. So my next course of action was to take it to Hollywood and let them financially pay the rest of it. Because I am very proud to say I have not taken a dime from any ufologist, any interested person on this journey. I've got about $20,000 of my own money invested. I'm not going to be accused to be a UFO grifter. I don't want any money from the public, but, and I tell people, Hey, let's let Hollywood finish this off for us. Let them finish all my loose ends and let them use their money. I don't want to take $20 from some interested uf uf ufologist or some, somebody interested in ufology. So I'm very, very proud of that, that uh, we've kept this pure as, as much as possible. And uh, so I sit here today waiting for, you know, the green light from a network to, to buy the documentary and start production on that. And in the meantime, wrote this, uh, came across this information about a second Roswell crash and saw that there was a niche, saw that no one had compiled all six or seven accounts of this crash. I'm not saying those accounts are accurate or truthful. I, I say this in the book. Here they are. So you don't have to run around and Google the St. Augustine Plains or the second Roswell crash. Here is every single person in the past 75 years that has made a remark about a alleged second crash uh, the same day of the infamous Roswell Corona crash. That's all it is. I don't make any declarative statements. We don't sway one way or the other. We let the reader decide for themselves. Another thing that I'm very proud of. You know, we didn't want to go off into a tangent. And uh, so we're, you know, promoting the book now. And you're on the pulse. And Caroline, as, as you and I were talking about, Carolyn, sorry, um, uh, th that uh, what has really been taking over my life or is, is the emails, the contacts that have been coming to me in the past five or six months, especially like in the past four weeks. It's been like an onslaught of insiders of people that work for the military, people that wor worked in these programs, people that were on the periphery of these programs, a psychiatrist, a, um, a woman who was a uh, electrical engineer for a DARPA project. I mean, it's um, I, I met a CIA agent and a retired in a bar who had some very bizarre things. She, she um, it almost ended up in a fight between her and I, like a screaming match. Get into that. Um, and um, but for the past four days, I've had this this gentleman who claimed to work for the DIA and Lockheed tell me this this bizarre story, which, you know, if you ever if you want me to touch on later in the in the program, I will. But so, you know, it's, it's like I, I want to take a break and breathe. But, it, you know, the UFO world is not letting me. And I guess that's my fault. That's, you know, this is the responsibility of you want to go out there. You want to put your name out there. You want to ask for people's help. Here you go. Exactly. So, you know, I'm trying to, uh, trying to, you know, again, without sounding ham handed, without sounding Pollyanna, I am, I just want to be credited at the end of the day for a guy that worked his ass off for the people, the interested observers of the UFO community. If that is all that I am tagged with, whether you prove the Victor video or don't prove it or, you know, uh, documentary or a movie makes 70 million dollars you know it's it's irrelevant i just want to know that i'm going to continue to work my butt off for for people and and not give up the good fight and uh, and be truthful and honest and open good. and um and tell people what's going on so well your book is titled magdalena the second roswell crash right right correct so um I read it and and as I said to you, it was a very compelling read. It just kind of put the evidence out there, for, you know, yeah. lots of pictures of well-known, reputable folks so, so that you can visualize what that they're real folk. Uh lots of sightings and accounts. And it was it was excellently written, very, very clear, very easy to understand. It was a good quick read. Um Thank you. 
I, I definitely want to read it again because, you know, I always read books that I like twice because sometimes you, Me too. you miss a few things, you know, right. you miss Me a few too. things along the way. But um, let, let's talk about your book for a minute and or longer. Um, and and let's kind of let's let's just start with the obvious. Why did you write this book and and why hasn't this Magdalena crash site? had the same notoriety as Roswell. Where is the interconnectedness between them both? Great question. I wrote the book because, I, um, you know, I've, I've said this on numerous podcasts and on yours. I, I have been forced to watch as many documentaries as possible just to get little tidbits. And it, it has worked tremendously for the, my Victor investigation. One night I'm watching UFO Hunters, a program I've seen many, many millions of times. And they start talking about a second Roswell crash. I've always heard the whisper about it, mm -hmm. but never researched it or asked about it. And the the and I and I credit the UFO hunter team in my book. I mean, they peaked, they pushed me over the edge. Like, wait a minute, you know. And it was a very good program, but they only talked about one person's account of a alleged second crash. So I started doing my own homework, and in doing my own homework for my own interest. I found out that no one out there in the community has compiled all of these accounts. And there was about five when I started. There ended up actually being like seven um, when I got done with the book. Seven different people who who gave their, you know, their uh, their statement or their belief or what they were read and briefed or what they saw about the second crash. And I said, well, geez, that this, this is a book, you know, if, if I'm, if I'm trying to consolidate everything, so I don't have to keep Googling and go to this page and that page, who might help someone else that's probably looking for the, for the same, you know, the same brevity of, Hey, can somebody put this all in one book or put this all on one website? I just decided to put it in, to put it in book. So you'd go for and, it. So let, let's um, just go to Victor for a minute, because you mentioned Victor and for folks that may have not seen um, the alien interview uh, interview that we did. Just give us a five minute quick summary on who is Victor. Why why are we hearing his name? And I guess explain why he was the driving force behind the whole thing. Yeah, 1996, Rocket Pictures offices in Beverly Hills, California gets a bizarre phone call from a gentleman who claims he is a former government employee. And that he's got a three-minute VHS tape of an alien being interviewed in an underground facility. So, being a second-tier video production company, they of course said, "Yeah, come on!" And they were doing a, a like a Chevy Chase, Rodney Dangerfield uh, golf video. I mean, this was not a very serious. You know, I mean, this wasn't a company putting documentaries out for Nova in Nature on PBS. That's I'm just wanted to get that across. And they were doing like this golf video. I thought it was a Tim Conway, but I was corrected by internet warriors. It was a Chevy Chase, Rodney Dangerfield golf video. So he comes into the office via taxi cab because he doesn't drive. Um, shows him this tape. It's bluish grainy. It's this weird looking uh, alien, uh, gray alien that's tan. It doesn't have almond eyes. It's got round eyes. There's two military people in the foreshadow. Their shoulders get in the way. It's a continuous shot. There doesn't seem to be any production value, meaning a three camera shot or people not getting into the way or zooming in. It's just, let's set up the tripod and the camera and film it. Um, and, uh, you know, medical staff come into the room once the creature starts to, I'm sorry, I don't ever want to use that. Once the bean or the visitor starts to medically flag, and the medical staff is in short sleeve scrubs. And we we're told by Victor that that's because it was only bio level containment too, which is gloves, mask, and, and, and surgical caps. You didn't have to wear pressurized suits. And I think still to this day, the gist of the entire, the head scratcher of the entire video is Victor. Because to this day, I've never heard someone speak more scientifically, more intelligently than him in my life, and I've probably met 10,000 people, he to this day, his uh, his vernacular to this day defies, you know, my logic. I still, yeah, I don't care what PhD you have. I don't, I, I just, I'm, I'm uh, 
blown away by people that can speak that intelligently. He also does an Art Bell radio show where unrehearsed questions, and he goes on for an hour and a half. This, you know, people say, oh, he's, a, he's an actor on a, with a script. Well, he goes on Art Bell. The questions are not rehearsed. They don't know what the, he doesn't know what the questions are. And he fields and combats these questions for an hour and a half. Like he's, you know, like he's a, 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 a you know, a Olympic fencer. You know, he's just, he's switchblading every question um, that he can't answer. And this video always bothered me. And it had a little coding on the bottom, DNI slash 27. And uh, two years later, I'm running for Congress. I ask a senator, I've got the picture, the, the moment I asked him, I turned around, said he was a Navy person. So do you know what Department of Naval Intelligence is, which is supposedly the an acronym DNI? And this, he gave me this aggressive look and he said, you don't need to know anything about that. And choo, took off to the bus and I went and it was the start of like, this is 99. I'm like, wait, this was a hoax video, supposedly. Why did it just piss off this United States senator? You know, this is crazy. And 20 years later, at the start of COVID, um, I had some free time and um, a director called me from Hollywood and said, do you have any ideas for cheap documentaries? It's COVID. We got to get something out real quick. And I talked about this video. He didn't want to do it. He thought it was going to be way too complicated. Boy, was he right. <laughs> it's five years later. And we're, we still haven't crossed every T and dotted every I. Man, you want to talk about somebody with intelligence. And I started to investigate it. And I'm here five years later. I'm not telling you definitively it's real and Victor is real. I am telling you face to face, my eyeballs to the camera. I have not had one person in five years of hard nosed investigation come to me with any credible evidence that would pass in a courtroom to say this was a hoax. And we and even everybody had special... that, that was part of the production from the CEO yeah. to the director to I a month ago, I started interviewing people from the production. They all say the same thing. We didn't film it. We didn't see it being filmed. Right. So so the question is, I mean, I know 97 percent of the provenance and the answer, but I'm just asking and I'll stop. Question is, how can a retired government employee because he was vetted? The director right. vetted him, Victor. This was the director, director didn't say, well, show up on Wednesday. We'll see. The director spent two weeks vetting Victor, seeing if he was a government employee and whatnot. And I've heard this from intelligence people who said, I remember a director looking for the for Victor. So what we're supposed to believe is that a re retired government employee who didn't drive chore 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 choreograph. Uh, did a choreographed, coordinated video production of a of a animatronic being with casting and craft catering, renting the soundstage. Right. Um, does that even make sense? To I agree. I don't know. Maybe it does. So, and we, so, we uh, even had a special effects guy on yeah. on one of our interviews, and he right. had some concrete things to say, but yes. he never was yes. able to disprove it either. No. no. Absolutely. And, and, and one more thing, and I'm glad you brought that up. I want, I really, really want people who haven't heard me before to know one thing about me. I run towards the skeptics. There isn't a person that has emailed me, emailed podcasters who then emailed me. There isn't a skeptic in the world that tried to contact me that I did not run to. I mean, this Vince, Vince, this person that uh, yes. Carol Ann is talking about, with them. This guy is going to help me. Why? Because they just want to prove if it's real or not. So I don't want to dissuade experts. I want their help. When we do put this, try and recreate this film, yeah. um, I will have I will have the, the provenance and these experts to help me see if we can recreate this being to look exactly the way it did on a film. So right. very big tenet of my investigation. I run, leap, gravitate towards people who are skeptics because I want to hear what they're thinking because that's only going to help me in my investigation. And I can vouch for that because Vince was kind of on the attack in the beginning and you met him with open arms and ears and eyes and the two of you buddied up so fast. It was great. It, yeah. it was great. Yeah. It was, there was, I, I'm going to run. People, people, people want to see that podcast 
because a, she, Carol Ann should have done a, a, a YouTube short when three Italians get together to talk about <laughs> aliens. All of our hands are going and they're screaming and yeah. That's a good idea. It was classic, classic. <laughs> that great was, theater. that was great. That was great. It was awesome. Yeah, I spoke to him not long ago. He's a great dude. Really, really great good. Guy. Great so guy. Let, let's let's make sense out of um, Roswell and Magdalena. And yeah. let's talk about time frames and, and, and let people get like some kind of uh, gr grasp on like the demographics, the time frames between the two. And then we'll talk about, you know, the rest of the book, what we what you think happened and what some of the possibilities yeah. are. You know, it's end of June, 1947. There is a horrendous lightning storms all over um, New Mexico. And, and we talk about that in detail. Um, but it was at the end of June that a, a, an Air Force man, uh, uh, air, airman named Tom Carey and a couple of other Air Force personnel at Roswell at a corner of the base saw three objects objects in the air. And it's important to 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 first put down on the chalkboard three objects witnessed end of June. Because this is important because this story is crazier than the Victor story. This story is more convoluted and crazier than Roswell. I, I mean that. I maybe it doesn't have the gravity of it, you know, because there's you know, we don't have 700 witnesses like in Roswell, but this story is has more twists and turns than a, than a Formula One track. So a couple of days later, the, the storms start to intensify as New Mexico starts preparing for the 4th of July. And on the West Coast, a United Airlines pilot, Emerald Smith, Emil Smith, United Airlines, flying through the same thunderstorm that encompassed the West, um, sees an array of objects. Now it wasn't two; it was more. We some people claim that was three. You know, he described it as an array of flying objects that completely mystified this season. United Airlines captain, and so we go to allegedly. Um, you know, the, the the storm intensifies on July fourth, and it was July 5th that Max uh, Brazel decides to take a ride along his ranch and some portions of his ranch because he heard, you know, hellacious thunderstorms and Max comes across this debris field. And we all know the story. He, you know, collects it, takes it to the sheriff. The sheriff then calls uh, the Roswell Army Airfield. Um, I'm very careful to say that because uh, uh, I was proud that uh, I, uh, in the beginning, I used Wright Field, not Wright Patterson, because it wasn't called Wright Patterson in 47. So I, it was, uh, I became a stickler of like, so, you know, internet warriors don't, you know, like you don't know what you're talking about. So <laughs> Roswell Army Airfield, because there was no Air Force back then, even though I used Tom Carey was in the Air Force, but he was in the Army Air Corps is what it was called. And so the, the material is taken there. Um, they, 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 there, uh, there is they get a, a notification that there's another crash site with the craft with bodies um and another team is sent out to retrieve that the craft is brought back or the the, the debris it's sent to fort worth one bean was alive that bean was sent to kirkland air uh, airfield then sent to los alamos the only kind of biological retention facility, so on and so forth, back in 1947. God only knows what they were studying. And they re Walter Hout releases a report. Yeah, I know I'm skipping things, but we're not talking about Roswell. Releases a report to the media. The Army has, you know, uh, captured a flying saucer, a disc. And a day later, that's retracted. It's a flying balloon. Jesse mm. Marcel is in a room with balloon wreckage um and the whole thing is squashed and uh fades into obscurity until stanton friedman gets wind of this in the late 70s and starts to i like to use the word reconstitute the dry powder of roswell in that story and he brings it back into the consciousness of america and um People start researching the entire Roswell and a branch starts researching a, a couple of guys, uh, one who I became uh, incredibly close with, Donald Schmidt and Kevin Randall. And we find this story that this gentleman 
who worked for the U.S. Conserv soil conservation. So he went out, he helped farmers on behalf of the government to improve their crop production, um, what new things and new techniques are being used, and uh, a really good positive government and program, if, if, you, if you want me. He was very well-liked and respected. You know, somebody that deals with farmers successfully, Carol Ann, you, you know, you kind of, that kind of gives you a little bit of a, uh, an indication that they're, Probably, you know, a straight shooter comes up with this crazy, crazy, bizarre story. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing. His name was L. Grady Barney Barnett. And he said he was driving on the St. Augusta Plains. So if Roswell and Corona are on the east, there is the Loera, Loera Mountains and then the St. Augustine Plains. OK, and then you go towards the west, like, you know, California and other states and whatnot said he was driving on the St. Augustine Plains and a metallic object was shimmering and caught his attention off the highway. And he pulled off the highway and he approaches this, his story, approaches this craft. There is bizarre metal ob fragments all over the place, a common theme, which we've heard. There were four beings that were dead. And as he came about upon this craft, a team of alleged archaeologists, whether that was the professor, the teacher, students, people getting their PhDs, he was loosely termed a team of archaeologists, also came upon this wreckage. And he said within a blink of an eye, Army personnel uh, uh, led by a, a 1947 shop, a, a car with Army personnel and, and um, higher-ups in it, approached and started to cordon off the area, screaming, warning the archaeology students and Barney himself that, uh, you know, you go back to your, you know, cars on the road. You are to forget about this. They said they went back on the, on to the road and it was like a, um, like a disaster scene, more military vehicles and apparatuses. They just, he described a back, a, uh, like a back, uh, a tow truck, type device mm -hmm. from the army um obviously to to to, to pick up the, uh, the 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 craft is what it is what it would be and um so don schmidt and kevin randall it i mean the first story out of the gate becomes it starts the crazy the crazy train so they everyone believes this story including stanton friedman very important come to find out Somebody finds his wife's diary or was given his wife's diary or talks to Barney's wife. He was detailing everything like we went to A&P. <laughs> That's a store back from the 60s and 50s, folks. We went to the A&P. We bought a dozen eggs and a gallon of milk. I mean, really detailed diary. In her diary, she was with Barney all day. Doesn't mention a UFO crash. So right away, it's the, you know, hop on the crazy train. Here is this supposed salt of the earth government employee a person that uh, that uh, interacts with farmers right and you know he's lying completely apparently to his wife he is so you know the ufo researchers at the time kind of do a, sh a shoulder shrug and you know like what is this now and it's like and I, forgive me for being glib and this is the way i communicate so to me it's it was almost like a stage show and it was like, you know, some you know, lady in a, in, a, in, a, in a headset going backstage going, OK, next, who's who's next on the crazy train of Magdalena? And so here comes Gerald Anderson in his I believe it was in his 30s or 40s. He tells a story back in the early 90s that he was with his father and uncle and family members. And they came across a, a, a craft in beans on the plains of St. Augustine, uh, they also encountered a group of archaeologists. Gerald Anderson goes into great detail about the being. He goes under hypnotic regression. He talks about what the being looked like. He, uh, he had somebody sketch out what the being looked like, a typical gray with a flight suit. And he says that, um, that he remembers one of the names of the archaeologist group, a Professor Bursick. And I'm chopping that, but just go along with me here. It's been a long day. Bursick, Busek, B-U-R-S-I-K, B-U-S-I-K. 
So Randall and Schmidt start researching this. Lo and behold, there's an archaeology teacher at Gerald Anderson's high school named Busick. They go ask him. Uh, Gerald Anderson was never in my class. I was never with him on the St. Augustine Plains. I don't know what he's talking about. Now he refuses to give up his transcripts. He starts telling a story that he once was a Navy SEAL or in special operations. You can, you can write the rest of this story. But, you know, this guy goes on camera for an hour and a half and talks a, about a detailed story in the hypnotic regression, um, talks about the bean, whether that's true or not. So can you imagine me? I, like, why well, I'm nowhere closer than I was uh, three weeks ago when I started investigating this. And uh, I'm just going over. I'm just going over my notes. So now a really convoluted story happened. So you know. So here it is. We have an alleged crash, not Corona Roswell. Roswell, other side of the Lower Air Mountains in an area called the San Augustine Plains. This is just west of Dato, D A T I, Mexico, New Mexico, and a big, the larger town Magdalena, which people in the intelligence community refer to this crash as the Magdalena crash, hence the name of my book, just because it was the largest town closest to the mm -hmm. crashes, if that makes sense. Makes sense to me. So now, um, in the kind of the same time frame that Schmidt and Randall um, are investigating this, this crazy Gerald Anderson, Barney Barnett story, a guy comes forward, Jim Ragsdale. Mm -hmm. You're not going to believe this one. This was very Plains. compelling. So, and and this is the part where I get tongue-tied. I mean, I have so many. This guy made me Looney Tunes just reading mm -hmm. his account. So I'm trying going to try and get this straight. So Jim Ragsdale, st st I'm still not clear whether he was married at the time, is with Trudy True Love. Folks, I'm not making this up. This is like this is like a dime store detective novel. And they at first were in his pickup truck. Um, and he says that the night uh, of the crash, that he was making, he was naked with Trudy True Love. They were making love in the back of their pickup truck. They were completely naked when this meteor or streak across the sky went right over them and crashed just over the rise, you know, um, a half a mile from them. Uh, they were shocked, but they thought it was, it was possibly a meteor. They stayed there all night. And in the morning, kind of following what Barney Barnett and Anderson are saying, and in the morning, they go over the ridge in their pickup truck. Important to understand that. So they traverse in a pickup truck over the ridge, and they see this shiny metallic craft. Again, metallic shards laying all over the place. The army is there. Um, there are other civilians there that he doesn't make that he doesn't know who they are. And they lay out of sight. And, and you know, he just says the same thing. It's screaming. It's you go over here. They're cording it off. And he said that a 10, a 10 vehicles showed up, army vehicles showed up, and they fantailed out. Um, and they spent, the, the for as long as he, Jim Ragsdale was there, they spent the time, you know, collecting and, and sifting through the sand and whatnot. So, um, so he says that at this time it was 40 miles of, of uh, northwest of Roswell. Well, they start to a, a very intrepid reporter named Philip Bar Philip Barrett, who I acknowledge in the beginning of my book, starts to you know really do detective work, work the phones, go out, come shoot detective, knocking on doors, talking to witnesses, talking. I know, shocking you a ufo ufologist that just want to be on a computer talking to people who actually own this property. And there was about three or four different people who were sub, you know, subdivided, who owned this alleged crash site property. And all of these people, I've got a couple of their names, Dorothy, App, a Dorothy Apps, uh, a Bill Edgar, who was a farmhand. Um, all of them, all three or four of them, the Cox family, they all said the same thing. There was nothing crash. There was no army people. There's no depression in the ground. Um, a couple of them uh, has said that they were out there four days later. It was meticulous. But, but interesting, one of them said you can't get there via a pickup truck. You have to. The only way we, this was 
this was um, validated by other people that own parts of this property of this ranch. The only way to really get to this area from there, from the east, was uh, on horseback. Now the government obviously must have taken another another route because um, Ragsdale said there was multitude of vehicles, kind of reaffirming the Barnett story. So now um, Ragsdale's daughter has him do an affidavit. She kind of takes over as his mouthpiece. He's dying of cancer. Ragsdale's wife said, I, I've never heard of Jim talk about this. Well, who's, you know, he had an affair with Trudy Trula. Wait, what? Was this before me? Was this after me? Now he tells Randall and Schmidt that it wasn't a pickup truck, that it was an army Jeep he used. And the story, again, like Barnett, like Anderson, I'm not laying blame at them, but the story starts to unravel. He can't remember this. He won't validate that. Oh, so much to the point where they, 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 um, Barnett or some, uh, another reporter contacts, um, contacts uh, Kevin Randall in England while he was doing a conference or something and said, look, the story is this, now it's this. You know, um, now the wife said she never heard anything. Now the wife saying that one time when he was drunk, he mentioned something to his friend. He, she over, he overheard it. And well, if you're overhearing your husband having an affair, why are you, why did you not confront him? I mean, it's just a completely convoluted story. And when, when, um, when Kevin Randall um, was asked, you know, and kind of confronted with all of these misconceptions and misinterpretations and 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 um, things that just didn't add up and were not, you know, cohesive. You know, um, uh, uh, Randall said, "We just don't think he's very truthful." No, mm -hmm. being the intrepid reporter that I think I would like to be or be known as eventually, taking the the um, the Barrett uh, the, the the Barrett, uh, you know. Following the sources, I talked to Donald Schmidt and I said, what, what, tell me, I, I, my brain's fried. Just tell me the end result of the Ragsdale story. And uh, uh, Don Schmidt, I, who I refer to as my uncle Don, said that, look, I believe that they came across a crash uh, of, a, of a plane and not beans. And, and that's, and that's what I believe. I do not believe that he saw a um, the crash of a UFO or an off-planet vehicle. So, you know, so right now, at that point, I've got the, you know, I'm rubbing my temples going, oh God, don't go on anymore, please, John. So, so now I've got all of these crazy stories and I find a book that was written by a United States Air Force counterintelligence agent. I know counterintelligence. His name was Colonel Richard French. Um, he wrote a book in the, the, the 2008s or 10s, I believe, and verified Air Force pilot, you know, um, verified counterintelligence, a little shaky because he came out years earlier that there was underwater UFOs, which are really being kind of proven now, or really being talked about. So how crazy was he back in 2000s talking about underwater uh, vehicle, you know, extraterrestrial vehicles? So here's his story. Follow this bouncing ball. He claims that the, the craft, one of the crafts, was brought down. It was not the electrical storm, um, but that it was a pulse weapon attached to a, an experimental airplane from Los Alamos. Now, Alice, Los Alamos, that whole complex was only about 70 miles from St. Augustine, about 110 from Roswell. If I'm wrong on that, I'm sorry, but general area. So this is not far fetched. It's not like it, it came from Holloman air force base, or it came from San, you know, Coronado or San Diego, or, you know, from Texas, um, Texas air force, uh, air army, air corps, uh, a base that this experimental aircraft developed um, at Los Alamos had a, a had an experimental pulse weapon, which was shot at the craft um, in in uh, uh, late June, early July. Remember that the, the, remember late June, early July that this pulse weapon was shot at this craft. It disabled his avionics, and that is why this alleged second crash craft a craft crashed. Hmm. Okay. 
how do we go about this one? <laughs> now we find, now I find in the Huffington Post article, a man that I attempted to interview for the Victor story. And that interview went sideways real fast. Um, I was 55 years old and I was bothered at by another adult male. So there was a really uncomfortable moment in my life, but uh, um, I take it all to my blame. I just rushed him with questions and his name is Colonel John Alexander. I think many UFO people know him. He's a famed in UFO, UFO, uh, UFO, U, the UFO world for conferences. He was part of um, a very clandestine group. Um, and he also worked on propulsion and he also worked on lasers and, and radar applications and, 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 and all kinds of black projects that would surround UFOs or experimental aircraft. And he emphatically said that Colonel French is crazy, um, that there's no way, absolutely no way in 1947 that a pulse weapon was developed and in, in, in developed to the point where it would actually shoot down a, an extraterrestrial craft that was a thousand, 10,000 years advanced, more advanced than what was on planet Earth. So here is this. And then he goes on to say that, well, I was part of trying to develop something like that, but that wasn't this. That was in the 60s. So he doesn't pull, pull it out right. He actually comes back with a, no, it's not a crazy story. We tried to do it in the 60s. Because when I'm telling you that story is crazy, it never happened in 1947. We had absolutely no capability to do this. So I am talking with Stephen Greer, who's been instrumental in the Victor investigation, just for his knowledge of how many people he has interviewed, his knowledge of facilities, of coding, of, of nomenclature, you name it. He's just been wonderful. I'm telling about the book and I'm telling about Colonel French. He said, well, I, I don't think that that's i think colonel alexandra might be wrong i'm like what? what please unpack this for me so uh dr greer starts to tell a story that he has told on numerous podcasts where um three roswell uh personnel who witnessed or touched or you know was was part of the cover-up and the craft and the, the craft and the retrieval you name it Told Dr. Stephen Greer that no, there we launched this bizarre. He they told him it was a radar type application pulse weapon that it that it it, it, it um that the radar was turned on. This wasn't actually an aggressive, like a um a uh, I, I forget the military term. It, it wasn't a, a a an actual weapon. It was simply a high advanced radar system. And it's, and it's when they turned on this radar system, that is what they think interfered with one of the craft and caused its crash. So we have like these two stories of some kind of man-made electronic disturbance, as I call it. I think that is a good way to put those two, you know, Colonel French in the Greer, um, in the Greer uh, uh, airmen in one kind of compartment that, you know, possibly uh, that a man-made electronic disturbance caused one of the cra these crashes. Then the, I think, which is the linchpin, I talked to Richard Doty, former counterintelligence, U.S. Air Force. You know, when you're in counterintelligence, one thing for sure, you are briefed on almost everything that um, the government wants you to investigate or to be part of. I mean, you are, you have to be told the story, shown the story, the documents, the film. And uh, coincidentally, Richard Doty tells this story to Dr. Greer. And he then, uh, well, I'm going to tell that story first. So he basically tells Dr. Greer, coincidentally, which is funny, that yes, yes, a second craft crashed. And I was shown the 16 millimeter film as part of a wide, um, a wide package of crash retrieval that started with the 47 Roswell crash. And he said, here is the story. It wasn't until two years later that uh, that a uh, that 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 craft that crash scene was uh, was brought upon that the the army found this this 
crash scene and came upon it and retrieved it. It wasn't until 1949 because of the remoteness in the Luera Mountains, not the St. Augustine Plains. It was at the base of the Luera Mountains. Shows me a satellite photo. It's bizarre of the ground. You see the ridge line. Okay. Now, Doty disagreed with me. I think I'm right. You see the ridge line. Okay. Of this, of this plateau, but about for about 40 feet, you don't see a line in the sand, Caroline, like some bulldozer, you know, oh, moved wow. the ridge to you. You it's so it's, I, I was, you know, I was not yelling, but I'm like, Rick, you, 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 there's no line there for like 40 feet. Like some mechanical device pushed the dirt somewhere or the sand somewhere. It's so obvious. And so, he said, look, you know, I, I'm just about had it with the UFO community. I was briefed on this. I saw the 16 millimeter film of the of the Roswell uh, bodies in a tent, the 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 the, uh, the flight systems from the from the craft. He said, I'm briefed on the 1940 uh, uh, Magdalena crash. People are telling me that I don't know what I'm talking about. So I go back to Doty. And so I said, look, could you write me in black and white? exactly what happened and this is Doty's testimony 1949 now think think about all the other stories i just told you and how maybe they were woven in um to the legit maybe maybe the legit story and i'm not saying Doty's a liar i just don't want to make any assertions because that's not what the purpose of this book is this book is just to say here it is folks you take it Doty says in 1949 um a rancher who moved his cattle to a higher part of the Luera Mountains comes upon this crash. He contacts the sheriff uh, of, of, of the county. The sheriff doesn't get there for five days. The sheriff takes pictures, notes, contacts the Roswell Army Airfield. They don't respond for 20 days. Now, wow. it's, this crash with, with bodies has been there for two years. 20 days later, uh, personnel and equipment show up from the Roswell Army Airfield, and um, and uh, uh, I'm missing one part of the. I'm sorry. I'm, I have so much stuff going in my head. A team of archaeologists from New Mexico State University came upon uh, came upon the crash also and that's who contacted the sheriff so it was the rancher and these archaeologists like the same thing again like meeting at the same at the same crash site um but uh, and, and there's another person that says no they were from the university of pennsylvania the archaeologists so again we have archaeologists at the crash scene and Dodie said john this is the story he said john i was shown both craft anybody with any kind of a brain could see that these two craft crashed together. The hole in one craft, the 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 hole, the depression in the other craft. He goes, anyone, and then they said they showed sketches of that these two crash craft crashed together. He said they were egg shaped. Remember this. Dodie said the re, that the the pictures and the report, they were egg egg shaped craft. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And he said, I, I don't care what anybody says. This is what happened. And he said, we believe that it was the electrical storm that caused these two craft to crash together, not some pulse weapon. And Doty also affirms that, to my knowledge, to his knowledge, there were only two craft that crashed that night. And Doty says that it was not in July, that he is emphatic that these two craft crashed the same time, the same night, Back in late June of 1947, not July of 1947, which many people think that it crashed. They, these crashed on July 4th or the night of July 4th. Doty is emphatic to say, and who am I going to argue with a counterintelligence agent that is briefed on these programs? I mean, and, and, and parts of his story, you know, with the archaeologists and whatnot, I mean, just reaffirm. And he's like, John, don't let anyone tell you any different. They crashed in late June. It was an electrical storm. So that, that's it. And and um, so I'm about to go to press. Um, I'm compiling the stories. And now somebody writes me, oh, you need to you need to hear the Dr. Eric Davis story. And I'm thinking, is that the same Eric Davis, the Wilson Davis memos? Yes, it is. 
he talks about the Roswell crash. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, of course he did. You know, this has got to further complicate my book, and we're going to delay the you know going to press. So we kind of stop going. You know, I self publish this, by the way. People think that some rant, you know, random house, but I hired an editor who has a publishing company. I had to start my own publishing company, Red Dog Publishing. This is how you do it when you self publish. Just uh, people have asked me about that. And so I find the Dr. Eric Davis story. But before I do that, I call Nat uh, Leslie Keene, who is a contributor for the New York Times, who was very involved in the New York and the uh, UFO phenomenon stories. I said, is Le- Leslie, is Eric Davis legit? And she's like, oh, absolutely. You know, he worked for this. He, you know, worked for the government, um, for contractors. John, he is completely legit. Okay, great. I've just sourced Dr. Davis. Let's see what he has to say. And he says that when he was doing a briefing, that he was also given a briefing and saw documents where at Wright-Patterson Air, uh, Air Force Base, there is 10 velo binders. Velo binding is what uh, Kinko's can do. It's uh, plastic covers, and they kind of melt the spine together. They do this for movie scripts a lot. That's how I know. 10 velo bind binders of documents uh, regarding Roswell. And the, the the strange thing, once again, another crazy story that doesn't match up with some of the other stories is that it specifically said two manta ray shaped craft crashed together at the same time in Roswell. There was metallic pieces on the ground. There were bodies. And, um, oh, my God, uh, I'm trying to think of the one last thing. Um, that he said that, uh, you know, but basically that these manta ray shaped craft crashed together. So now we have Dodie's who saw egg shaped craft, you know, in the film. And we have people talking about a manta ray shaped craft. So, I, you know, again, I'm, st- I'm here to tell you, I don't know anything more about this than the day I started. This is how crazy this story becomes. Now, Eric Schratt, um, he is the ufologist he does military aeronautical history forgive me uh, uh michael michael Schratt, if i'm butchering your 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 uh, your expertise he um he is coming up with a story that says a warehouse worker in berkeley at the university of california berkeley specifically says this flatbed semi tractor trailer from the us army was seen on the campus of of University of California, Berkeley, backing into a warehouse. And under a tarp was this egg-shaped metallic object. And and, and the personnel person with Michael sketches what he saw. Now, I know, folks, this is crazy. Now, Linda Moulton House says, oh, you got to see this picture. And she's got a picture from downtown Roswell, 1947 in July, of a flatbed semi-tractor trailer truck from the Army with a tarp. And underneath it is a highly polished chrome egg-shaped object. Verified. Put it in the bank. This thing was rolling down um, Roswell. And and uh, people have gone to people in Roswell to, to say they, they remembered this parade, so this bizarre parade of, a, of an egg-shaped object, highly polished chrome going down the middle of, of, of Roswell, New Mexico. And what's funny is, you know, Ragsdale, Barnett, uh, Anderson, they describe a muted stainless steel gray material. So, I mean, you know, folks, I'd like to wrap this one up in a bow for you, but I, I just can't. But you know, because it's impossible. But I think that Doty's psychological disposition of his is, you know, being furious with the UFO public for just, you know, saying that he doesn't know what happened. That's like somebody telling me what they think happened a night that I wrestled, you know, on ESPN. Who the hell are you to tell me what my experience right. was? So I have to lend credit to Doty that Electrical Storm and Two Craft Crash. That is, that is about where I can, you know, stop my claim of egg-shaped manta ray. Now, Michael Stratt, and I'll end here, says that um, when this person at Berkeley looked into the big hole 
into this big shape craft. He didn't see chairs, avionics, anything other than like a, a, a another object, like the power source. And Michael Shred and I, this is interesting, kind of hypothesizes that is that maybe that egg shape was just maybe the power source that gets ejected before the crash or whatnot. Who knows? Mm. Because Eric Davis is claiming, no, these were manta ray shaped craft, but yet Doty and these other people are saying egg shaped. You know, we see the picture from Linda Moulton Howe. It's, it's polished Chrome. Other people are saying it's, it's dull, muted, dull stainless steel. So that that's the story. So I said, look, to not let anyone else go crazy in America, looking at all for all these stories, let me just simply put these stories, you know, into into a book with a with a, a nice prose and eloquent as best I can, eloquent writing, and to make it somewhat interesting for people to read and and uh, and that's where we stand. I have absolutely no opinion on the Magdalena crash as as much to the dismay, I'm sure, of many people because it's one crazy story conflicting with another crazy story. Yeah. How far away was Magdalena from Roswell in terms of like miles? About 70 miles. Magdalena, you- Magdalena was on the east side of the Luera, L-U-E-R-A mountains. So the, the coordinates people have given is the Luera, Luera mountains, St. Augustine plains, which is obviously the plains. And then to the North of the St. Augustine Plains is called Horse Peak. So you will hear people talk about St. Augustine, Luera, Magdalena, Horse Peak. They're all talking about the same. So, the same so what location. was this? A re- it was a mountainous area, obviously. Was it? Yes, ma'am. Was the crash uh, buried in a bunch of forest? Like, because I'm thinking, here's the military dealing with Roswell. So you would think they would do a flyover and cover a few hundred miles to see you know if anything else is going on why didn't they spot the magdalena crash was it buried in a forest like i love interviewing with you because you ask great questions now dody who showed me the satellite photo it's sand gerald anderson said that there and he gave descriptions of a type of bush that was out there gerald anderson said that it was you know, thicket and bushes and, and, and sparse trees and 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 but the Doty site was pure was was pure sand and that is what's at the base and that is where the rancher took his you know cattle up higher. That was the specific exactly. thing. He took cattle up higher to graze them and that's when he came upon um um this craft. So uh I, I can't answer why I agree with you. You would think there would be numerous numerous flyovers but again um probably be the fact that it was 70 and again i'm giving a generalized mileage estimate because i don't know either so you know we're, we're thinking it's probably 70 to 100 120 miles from the corona roswell um uh, area and and on the other side of the mountains and maybe it just wasn't a geographic place that where they thought they should hone in on i i don't really have an adequate answer to that. And it is a great question. And again, brings up yet another inconsistency. Brody showing the photo, sand, Gerald Anderson saying, oh, no, 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 no. Cottonwood. And he's got, there's a type of bush. Oh, God, I'm going to, I'm going to find out what that, what he said. A lot of bush, a lot of thicket. Said he actually came around a bend of some, some type of woods or forest. Um, so just two, again, conflicting stories. I, I just, um, I don't know if I'm ever going to solve this problem. Maybe I really don't want to or should either, but uh, it's a great question. Uh, thank you. Uh, the other thing I find, you know, it makes me kind of wonder, um, the pulse weaponry. Uh, I saw patents on the internet for pulse weaponry dating back to like the 40s. So the government, oh right. So the government obviously has been, you know, cre- creating this technology for quite some time. Maybe it wasn't a storm because the storm thing makes you wonder, you know, here you have craft, extraterrestrial craft from other galaxies, dimensions, and lightning storm knocks them out of the sky. I don't know. It just, it, it pulse weaponry makes more sense to me. No, I've had two two people tell me that the, the storms were biblical. It was about two, uh, 10 days worth of biblical 
biblical type lightning. Um, and uh, a, a rancher told me about a month ago, he goes, uh, kid, if you ever come ever come out to Mex New Mexico, you'll see that lightning and you, 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 you'll start to change your mind how, how bad it can be. So, you know, and I've talked to other people that live yeah. in New Mexico. I, I, I don't know either. You know, you're, I, I don't know what to tell you. I don't, I, Hey, internet yeah. warriors. I don't know either. So um, can I tell you something else? Remember, uh, you know, um, Tom Carey, they saw three objects. So we have Corona, we've got uh, Magdalena crash. Now the Chrome, object under the tarp on the flatbed that was never described by anybody who, from the Roswell army airfield. It was, it was, it was, uh, I think they called them half tracks. This was a semi truck that kind of went down like this and was attached to a semi truck. Now that was in July of 1947. My question is, is that a third craft that ended up in Berkeley that was hit by the pulse weapon. Yeah. And I, 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 you know, my head's, I don't want to confuse anybody more because I love your audience. I love you. <laughs> but I mean, I'm thinking, wait a minute, no one ever described a egg shaped chrome craft of the Roswell witnesses. Okay. Magdalena wasn't found in 49. What was that? What was that going through Roswell in July of 1947 that was egg-shaped was that the third craft brought down by a pulse weapon who freaking knows it just goes on and on it's the folks it's the it's the state it's when i finally published this book i remember with phil class who was the famous ufo skeptic had a newsletter and he wrote right before he died you could study the uf ufology your entire life and on your deathbed you will know less about ufology than you did the day you started. And I'm going to tell you something as cranky as that guy was. And as skeptical as that guy was, I'm starting to agree with what he's saying. I am starting to believe that I literally know less than I did 20 years ago, or certainly five years ago, meaning that I can't get a straight answer in a straight right. story. And that is, I guess, you know, kudos to the military, I, I guess, right. but you know, you also have civilians that have, you know, muddled the waters too. Yeah, exactly. There it is. That's, that's and it. now you have all these congressional hearings where, you know, our politicians right. are doing this because they know it's the next shiny topic to talk of about. Of course it is. Sure. Yeah. So you yeah. alluded to something in the beginning um, that you said you might discuss with us. What was that? Yeah. Um, uh, um, I'm going to be very careful just because that absolutely because I, I owe my sources this, and I want to be very cautious and tell you that Ross Coltart is on this story, not on it, actively investigating it, but he has been briefed by this insider also. And um, without going into st strong detail, I think this is the story, the UFO, I think this is, and I'm not taking anything away from my Victor story, because I have a video of an actual extraterrestrial, which is going to be more, if, if you know, proven completely legit is going to be more important than a photograph of the crucifixion of Christ, in my opinion. Take anything away from Christianity. Right. But I think this is might this that this might be the most important story since Roswell. There is a former defense contractor who is working for a defense contractor right now who was with the three alpha letter alphabet agency that emailed me and Ross Coltard. Uh, past week, two weeks, claiming that in the 1970s. Now, this is it's all very sketchy in my little in my little noggin. So bear with me. That in the 1970s, Lockheed was given an HI, non-human intelligent craft, and they success. This is what it was written. They successfully reverse engineered it enough to create their AVR, alien repro ARV, alien reproduction vehicle. That was this flux liner that I think the famous story, it was like at a trade show behind a curtain. People, Dr. Greer's told the story. However, through all sorts of means, they, they manufactured an even more high-tech alien reproduction vehicle. Right. This folks, this is just what I was told. So afraid that this would get out of their control, they 
told the United States government, you know that raft he gave us back in the 70s? Can't do anything with it. I mean, we, we did that real basic alien flux liner. It's, it's all we can go. This thing is so technically advanced. We just can't do anything with it. Do, you know, do, you know, we're willing to give it back. Now, I don't know if this is true. Voluntary repossession. It's going in the car business. And the government said, no, 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 it's all right. And at one point, Lockheed in the 70s said, we have all this aircraft. We have all these air helicopters. We have highly advanced radar that we're giving it to the military. But we have it before they do. What if we, um, you know, uh, created a crash recovery team and tried to get some alien vehicles ourselves before the government got them? I'm just telling you what I was told. Now, I had a military intelligence insider said, well, that's not the whole story. What? What? You mean there, there's some truth in that? And he said, look, they they did come up with their own crash retrieval team. I'm telling you what a military intelligence insider told me, not this other guy, that yes, Lockheed came up with their own military crash retrieval team to get their own vehicles in case they crashed on, you know, test flights. He said that, that at times the Lockheed team was merged or melded in with J, the JSOC team, the JSOC recover, recovery team, joint special operations recovery team. And, if, hey, it's John Stewart. Does the story get crazier? Of course it does. Tell us more. So, I'm not being glib. I'm just, you know, I'm laughing because oh, no. I'm too old to cry. <laughs> and then at one point in the southwest area of, of, of the United States, yesterday I found out it was a small town in Nevada. Listen to the bouncing ball on this one, folks. Lockheed is, Lockheed they're one of their alien reproduction vehicles starts to go off course and, you know, they have, the pilot is having a hard time navigating. They send the recovery team. I don't want to tell you where it was, where it came, that they, they came out of. They come upon the crash of the alien reproduction vehicle made by Lockheed. I want to be very specific as the recovery team from Lockheed is ascending on this crash. I, you're not going to believe this. The JSOC team was tracking the alien reproduction vehicle because they weren't told by Lockheed that they were test flying this vehicle that night. Oh yeah, oh yeah. This is a, oh. this is not the leaker. This is a military intelligence source telling me the leakers are lying to you. Firefight ensued. Now I, again, folks, this is what I was told. A firefight ensued. One of the JSOC soldiers was captured, for lack of a better word. This hyped up Lockheed recovery team was gearing it and it was taunting this soldier. This soldier ended, actually ended up dying. So did one, another soldier in the firefight for JSOC. And that both of these soldiers were of Asian descent. Why would you throw that into the mix? Very intelligent cider said that. And so did this other defense contractor leaker that it was two people died Asian descent. This was 2004, a small town in Nevada. So I don't know if Ross wants to team up and investigate this. What, what is scary folks is that we have a corporation that's acting as, as its own sovereign country to some degree, you know, your own air force, your own military um, apparatus, Maybe I'm stretching it to some degree. Um, it's just, it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's, this is not constitutionally what this country is all about. Right. You know, um, rogue corporations, rogue elements of the government running amok, spending our money. Carolyn, you, you and I have talked a million times. If people think this is about aliens to me, I knew there were other life form 30 years ago. This is about money. Right. I've, I've been a hardworking small business person since I was 19, whether I was a professional wrestler, a bar dealer, um, in real estate, you name it. I have been working my ass off since I was 17, 18. This is about money. This is about my money, my friend's money, your viewers, your money, your tax dollars being pilfered and whittled away while minorities 
and and people um impoverished people um are 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 going to, to school break school hungry being shot in their front yards you no know, after school programs decaying infrastructure what are we doing here you know Stephen Greer said that we spent maybe eight trillion dollars since 1947 on this whole crazy phenomenon I it just it's such a hard pill for me to swallow and so when I hear these stories of a rogue corporation and people being shot and 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 um uh you know the corporation not telling the military that they're test flying something and so that's obfuscation and you know and, and i feel bad for the military because the military is trusting these corporations giving them material saying help us and you take the material and abscond it for yourself and start to obfuscate our government and tell them when you're not going to test fly you know i'm not chastising Lockheed to that to the extent where they're it's a criminal element, but that's it's criminal to some degree. And people are dying. It doesn't surprise and, and this, me. It doesn't, it doesn't, no. you know, it's it's a fascinating story, but it, it doesn't shock me. Um no. I, I expect that from our government. I mean, look at how many trillions of dollars we're sending overseas. And um it, it, you're right, it is about money and it's about power, ideally. Yeah. So but uh, that that yeah, is a fascinating and that, story. Yeah, and and just to, to wrap up, you know that it's um the so the insider who emailed me also said this is, folks, you're not going to believe this angle. This is the rub with the legislation right now in Congress. Three or four, he specifically said three or four senators know Lockheed has their own way high tech advanced craft and. The other alien craft and, and the government wants it back. They want their uh, NI, NHI, non-human intelligent craft that it gave to Lockheed. It wants to repo it. Right. And Lockheed's going, well, oh, I, so this is, he's as he was trying to say, John, to, to follow the money again. This is the rub. Right. The senator who Lockheed has it. They want the craft. They want the craft back. This is why of the consternation in Congress. So take that, folks, as 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 whatever you. But this is what I've been dealing with for five wow. years. Of these, some of the stories that people tell me. Wow, I could. I wish I could be inside your head for like ten minutes. <laughs> God help you. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was brilliant. Uh, of course, I'll have where, folks. Now, I know your book's on Amazon, and it's also in other book retailers as well, correct? I don't, I, I don't, not not yet. Did you, it's, just, it's strictly right now with Amazon. Oh, I thought um, I saw it uh, somewhere else. Now, Amazon might not have, might have partnerships with other outlet. Uh, I, I, I am not, privy, I'm not privy to that, but uh, yeah, Magdalena. But Amazon is, is the place, right? Amazon's um, the We've got it really cheap on the Kindle version, just because, Hey, you know, I, I know, you know, people work hard if they can't afford the, the book. Um, I really wanted to kind of blow it out on Kindle just so at least somebody that can't afford it could could at least afford the two dollars and eighty eight cents yeah. on Kindle. And people, you know, and of course, I got made fun of that. Oh, it's too cheap. No, no. I want to have everyone who wants to read this have the ability to at least read it, at least electronically. So that's really yeah, nice. So if you can go there and, and people and again, I hate to say this because. Say so my words, but anybody that has any other information, please reach out to me. I answer all emails. John Allen Stewart at AOL.com. And I'm sure Carolyn, you'll put it up on the, I will. On the screen. And yeah. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much. Of course, I will be in touch with you again. I love yeah. speaking with you. It's always a pleasure, John. And keep us posted. You know, we want to know what's happening. Like if you uncover any additional, of course, information, um, I guess. You'll reach out, right? Yep. Yeah. 2024 is, is I, I hate to sound, uh, 2024 is going to be my year. This is, there's so much stuff building up and so many phone calls and so many inroads as far as, you know, conferences and, 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 um, and, uh, documentaries and other things uh, shooting out from the documentary. And, um, I, I, I think it's going to be the year of the ufologist and, yeah. and I, yeah. I hope I can participate in that with everyone because I cannot wait to just get this over with. And I, I, I mean that sincerely and get this over with, get this whole documentary thing and the whole Victor saga, give it to the public and, and let's move on um, and, and finish this story. And that's what we have to do as Americans. We have to demand that this story, the UFO phenomenon seeks its logical conclusion. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. You tell it at one of the best ways that I've heard. So thank you so much. And we'll be in touch soon, John. Thank you.